and that's a great uh, privilege. Dave's going to be talking through, helping us look at some of the objections that we may have and our friends may have about the Christian faith through uh, the lens of Luke's Gospel. Uh, and so it's great to have you with us. And what I'd like you to do after this session is to go to Dave and Kathy and go, guys, that was awesome. Come and work in New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Thank you for a very warm welcome. So, uh, that was great. Uh, what we do is we're going to, exactly like Mark said, we're going to look at questions and objections to, to, to Jesus, um, God, Bible, Christian faith. Uh, looking actually to answer our questions from Luke itself. Um, what we do though, first before we even get into Luke, is just to look at a little bit of 1 Peter. So grab an opening if you're going to Bibles to 1 Peter 3, 1 Peter 3, uh, verses 13 to 16. 1 Peter 3, verses 13 to 16, and Catherine's going to read that for us. That's a different mindset, isn't it? 
It's a very, it's a very liberating mindset, I think. There's a lot of freedom because what you're giving is the reason that you have hope. The reason you have hope in your life because of Jesus. So again, this is on your sheet. <clears throat> Using a very different approach, we can aim for a situation where the people we are speaking to, they feel like you're being positive. Like you're being affirming in a way that opens up a conversation. That you're even being surprising. Because if you're giving an answer for the reason, for the hope that you have, they might not understand what you're going to say. They might not guess what you're going to say. And you can feel like you're connecting at a personal level. You're in a quite a sympathetic way. And if you're giving a reason for the hope you have in Jesus, you actually might present to them Luke, because that's what you're doing this year anyway. So you don't need to be an expert in everything, just a, a beginner expert in Luke. And you can be a beginner expert in Luke by getting some basic training in Luke, which is what's happening to you this week. And you can speak with your Bible open. Because, oh, let me show you the reason for the hope that I have. It's Jesus. Let me show you Jesus with this little blank book that I'd love to share with you. You see what I'm saying? So answering people's questions and objections doesn't have to be uh, negative and defensive. It can actually be engaging and positive. Some more words on your page. It says this. People's questions and objections, not a problem. Many people have questions and objections about the church, Christian teaching, and what they perceive to be Christian values and behaviour. Some people we invite to read Luke, that is your little black Luke, uh, with us may hesitate or even refuse on the basis of these questions or objections. But rather than these questions and objections blocking the way to reading Luke with people, they can actually be the way into reading Luke. The questions and objections people have can often, often open the whole question of what God, God tells us about uh, through Luke's writing about who Jesus is, what he did, what he thought, and what he taught. Often it leads us to explain who Jesus isn't, uh, what he didn't do, think, or teach. And these surprising discoveries can open the way for people to do more research about Jesus by reading Luke with us. Does that make sense? Yep, I'm hoping that's true. Okay, I I've given us a good method for doing this. I'm going to explain it, I'm going to model it, and then I'm going to get you to do it. Is that okay? Now this is a model, that is, this is an example approach. This is not to say, here are kind of, I'm going to give you four steps. These are not the four commandments descended from God uh, into, into my, under my kind of piece of stone, okay? But these are the kind of ways that think helpfully, that I think helpfully for me, the way that I think, right? It may not be helpful for you, so feel free to modify things. So take notes as you go, thinking, no, that's dumb, I want to do this instead. That's great, that's really good. I'm Australian, I'm not a Kiwi. Uh, so you might be something really different about the way things work here. Uh, you might come in and incorporate a hucker or something, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> so just to agree with that, okay? But this is my brain. This makes sense for me and my brain, right? Right, I hope you feel that. So, there are four parts to this method. Part one, a question or objection. And I've made some notes here on your page. It's important to listen carefully to someone's a question, an objection, or comment that relates to Jesus and Christianity. Okay? So listen carefully, what are they actually asking or objecting to? Second, second step is a story about Jesus. That is, we can respond to many issues with one of the events, stories, or conversations from Jesus' life recorded in Luke, in the back book. <clears throat> if someone will let you read Luke with them, they'll actually open it with them, great. If not, you can just retell the Jesus episode. You don't need to include all the, every element of every story if you're going to kind of do that. But just kind of the big idea, the main points of the story, which are pertinent to the situation. Now, they may well let you open Luke, but they may not. Either way, you know how to be prepared. Point three, uh, a life issue or application. That is, we need to give a brief summary uh, to attempt to apply the story of Jesus to our hearer's particular situation or ideas or issues or comments or objections or questions, whatever it is you want to write. I'm oh, sorry, that's on the other, on the other sheet. Uh, point four, an invitation to read Luke. You can invite them to follow up, research more, check the facts, 
uh, clarify the issues, etc., by reading the review. Does that make sense? Okay. So I've listed down there on their next piece of paper a, a whole bunch of questions or really objections that people often have to Christian faith. And they'll use that as a, as a blocker, as a kind of a way of saying, no, I can't read really with you because I've got this issue. Uh, and what I'm saying is, no, I think quite the opposite. Actually, these it might be uh, the way into reading Luke with someone. Let me, uh, why don't you just kind of trace your eye down that, that list for a moment, and I'll show you uh, one example. So just have a little look at that list. You can see all the different things are listed there. things you can ever do is to read the Bible. Again, big surprise. Thinking, yeah, good one. Yeah, yeah good one. So, <laughs> in fact, can, can I show you? Can I show you how it works this way? And at this point, kind of, you can see kind of people tensing up a little bit. Say, no, because I want to, I want to show you the evidence. Because that's what scientific people do is look at the evidence, don't they? Ha ha! Dear them to be. I just want to show you a little bit, just, just a few sentences, okay? I want to show you. All right, Luke one one to four. Come with me to Luke one one to four. Grab your Bible. Uh, again, they might have kind of uh, want to let you open the Bible with them, but if they don't, that's okay. You can just tell them about some of these words, some of these ideas. Luke 1, 1 to 4. Says this. I'll let you find it in a little black book or in the Bible. I'm reading a New International Version, but whichever translation you've got is just fine. It says this. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. Just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you've been taught. See, what you can say to people is, look, look at the way he thinks about these things. Notice what he's done. He's actually looked in verse 2. For eyewitnesses. That is, he's not just looking for kind of random believers in a mystical religion. He's looking for people who saw what happened. He wants the best kind of evidence you can. Don't believe in kind of CSI or TV shows. Most things are still decided by eyewitness accounts, even today. So he wants people who actually saw what happened. Not only that, he's been really careful about the whole thing. Notice verse 3. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully, notice that, carefully, great care, investigated, notice that, scientific procedure, everything, not selectively, just kind of for some religious bias, from the beginning, that is everything that happened all the way through, notice what he's doing, he's saying, here is my research method. I am actually explaining to you my research method of how I put together my evidence. So what I did is I got the real evidence, the trustworthy evidence, the eyewitness accounts, and I actually sifted through it all. And not just kind of the little bit I wanted to, I was very thorough. From the beginning, I looked through all of it. And then what did I do? Notice that? Notice what he says here, up and through verse uh, 3. I, uh, too, decided to write an orderly account to you. So his research was very thorough, and now his writing about it is very careful and orderly account. And in case you think there's some kind of hidden bias in this all, notice he says, 
uh, is writing to someone called uh, Theophilus, verse 4, so that you may know the certainty of the things you've been taught. So here's his bias, here's his goal, he's explaining it up front, he's been really honest about this. <clears throat> he's trying to convince this Theophilus guy about this stuff. And, and two things about it, not, notice in verse 4, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you've been taught, that he can have a, a deeper assurance that the, the things that have been reported to him have an evidential or an evidentiary basis. Actually, he wants Theophilus to know what's true and real. Not just kind of some mythology. What's true and real. Uh, so he wants Theophilus to know what actually happened, which is a very scientific mindset. And back to verse 1, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. Fulfilled actually explains not just what happened, but their meaning. Uh, the, the theological meaning, the meaning in terms of what God has done in them. So here is the way that the book of Luke opens, saying scientific research methods, careful clinical writing, actually a very rational goal to make an out outcome in terms of what it all means. In fact, see, my problem with people who don't believe in the Christian faith is they do so on the basis of superstition. They do so on the basis of, of assumption and ignorance. Dear friend, I, I hope you're not an ignorant fundamentalist who's never done the research, who's just a superstitious objector to Christian, to, to Christian faith. I really hope that you are indeed scientific and logical and rational. Because if you are, you'll do the proper research with me. Why don't you come and read Luke with me? Do you see what I'm doing there? I'm trying to say to someone, actually, I, I take your objection so seriously, I'm going to talk about it in surprising ways that actually connect with the way that you're thinking, you connect with your objections, but use your objections actually to invite you to come and read Luke with me. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you want to ask any questions? Ask, make any comments about that before I get you to do some work? Um, Please. Hi. Um, so I've had sort of similar conversations, and then that, this kind of um, conversation usually lead, leads on to a conversation about so how can you actually trust what you're reading then? Yeah. Yeah. So how would you place that or say that well? You mean uh, how can you trust what you're reading in terms of how do we know we can trust the eyewitnesses? Uh, the, yeah, the eyewitnesses and like, because people were like, oh, but that was written like hundreds of years after. Luke was written hundreds of years after. Well, that's what they think. Anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can actually ask the question, why, why do you think that? What evidence do you have that that's true? Yeah. And the answer is, no, they have no evidence that that's true. <laughs> so actually they're basing their assumption, actually their assertion, even more than an assumption, on superstition and ignorance. So I think at that point you can call them out. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. Since all of the evidence points in the other direction, what evidence do you have for what you, what you seem to believe? None? That's actually fairly superstitious. So let's go back to the evidence and look at the evidence if you really are a, a logical, rational and scientific person. Now that sounds all a bit cold and clinical, but because we're talking about people who are rational and scientific and logical, they're cold and clinical. <laughs> I know because I'm one of them. <laughs> that makes sense. Some of the other, other objections are actually are much warmer. They're actually about more deeper, more uh, emotional, relational issues. But this is kind of the most cold and clinical of the questions. Um, the other thing you do, of course, is to say, well, let's just test it and see whether it kind of seems reasonable as you kind of read through the gospel. But I think if, it's, uh, if they're making a claim about evidence in history, you want to actually see the evidence in history. <laughs> Yes, so that's really helpful. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? No? Okay, I'm, I'm going to need to road test it. So what I want you to do uh, is, you can see the whole list of different objections, and I've given you some sample verses, or some sample verses uh, there in Luke to kind of look up. What I want to do is, I probably want to break some little wording groups in your rows, okay? So let's make each row a little uh, wording group. Okay, got it? There's the element of surprise. And why is it great? The end point is because it's the, the non-religious person gets justified. How, how would you put that as a starting point? 
Because you might say to someone, that's so good, because Jesus is actually not interested in religious people. Actually, the opposite. Jesus spends his time with people who aren't religious. He just wants to help people to get to know God. He's not that interested in religion, really. People go, oh, you, can't, you can't believe that. It's like, well, I'll tell you a story. <laughs> Do you know, see what I mean? So you're actually opening up the way for the conversation. You're opening up the way for an invitation to read Luke, where people will find a Jesus they don't expect. A Jesus who doesn't call on them to kind of go to religious stuff and kind of be involved in rules and regulations and rituals. But a Jesus who welcomes people into a relationship with God. Big surprise. Uh, so thank you. No, that's really helpful. That's really helpful. Now, you, you tackle the second one, is that right? Oh, yeah. What else did um, you do? We did the Christian in Christian is so six. Oh, yeah. Anyone else who else like six to one? Yeah, yeah, for okay, second, right. Only the guys. Yeah. <laughs> and what did you do? What did you say? Um, yeah, but I do think that the um the egg is a surprise because the woman is honored about all the needs in something in a way that you don't really expect. So um oh, I'm not going to say well. You kind of like Jesus kind of used the woman to rebuke the men around her and like they kind of being sort of thinking about like she was like a sinful woman and things like that. And it's the fact that she was also considered a sinful woman and wasn't the same woman that Jesus was using. So yeah. um, and at that time I think it would have been more radical because women have not much of the same anymore. So the fact that women are saying you know, this woman, um, you know, she's treated me much better than you have, because it was like quite scandalous. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's it's Amazing story, actually, in there in, in uh, Luke seven. nine, isn't it? seven, seven. Yeah, that's right. Um, okay. Again, um, when you hear that objection, that is Christianity so sexist. What do you think that the person saying will expect you to say to them? No, it's not. No, it's not. Okay, that's exactly right. That would make sense. Right? No, it's not. That's the defensive, correct defensive response. No, it's not. What would be the most surprising thing you could say? In the opposite direction. Yes, but in the opposite direction. No, that's right, that's true. Go, go, tell us more. Like, in opposite as in that, in this passage, it's not, it's kind of sexist towards men and that the woman is, is exalted higher than them. That's right, so there's two ways to go, aren't there, with the no? There's not, oh, yeah. Isn't it bad the way that Jesus talks down to men? <laughs> <laughs> they didn't see that coming, did they? They did not see that coming. Because you can actually show a heap of times where Jesus is having a big backhand up at all these blokes. It's all over the place. When does Jesus criticise women in Luke's Gospel? Nowhere. It's extraordinary, isn't it? So you actually find heaps of places where he's kind of giving the guys a smack. And all these places where he's endorsing the women. You think, yeah, Jesus, so sexist, unbelievable. I feel offended. Personally, he's a bloke. <laughs> so that's one way to go. That's really helpful. So it's one way to go, isn't it? You actually spin it all around. Okay, that's not what they're expecting. We can actually show Luke's great for this. How much Jesus endorses women. Because women are the people who seem to come to, to Jesus in gym and kind of faith and need. Whereas the blokes are cocky and think they can get the job done themselves. The world hasn't changed, but um, what's the what's the other way you can say uh, you could give a surprising answer? Someone says Christianity is so sexist. <coughs> yeah, that's right. I think you can actually agree and say, yeah, isn't that weird? Because Jesus isn't. Isn't that weird? So the church gets this stuff wrong, does it? All these awful things, which obviously. Jesus is not sexist at all. Jesus is so pro-women. And again, that's a big surprise. People don't think about Jesus in that way. Again, you can take the same story. So, here's two people. They're at a dinner party. It gets a bit awkward because you, kind of, you have to choose sides in this dinner party. They've kind of set up the social situation that way. There's the bloke who's, it seems, a, a powerful, well-respected kind of guy. And a woman. A few rumours about her. A bit, a bit of background chat. A bit of gossip about her. So who would Jesus stand with? Who would Jesus actually honour? And who would Jesus shame in that social situation? Shames the bloke, honours the woman. 
So he's not a sexist guy. Church gets it wrong, Jesus gets it right. Please. Uh, so, by doing, by telling them all this, how then do you defend yourself against Paul, the apostle, who then goes on to say some quite sexist things? Yeah, so yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, I think that people are concerned that at the deepest level, that women are seen as less than men. That, that's kind of the biggest, the biggest issue. And I think if you go and you see what Paul says in Galatians, he's, he's deeply uh, defensive of this issue, that is, it's not the case, that actually men and women together are full sharers uh, in God's salvation, you know, Galatians 3, 28, by the male or female stuff, which is not a comment about transgender, but about uh, our role in salvation. Does that make sense? So I, I, think, I think that's the issue, actually. We want to show people that that's the case. The average person, I think, is not thinking of 1 Timothy 2 when they're kind of thinking about this stuff. They're actually thinking about the treatment of women generally. They're not even thinking about kind of necessarily about leadership structures in the church, though they might be, but they're actually thinking about women being treated as second-class citizens, either historically or personally experientially. Um, and I think that's massive. That's the massive issue. Yeah. Do you want to come back on that? Please feel free. Happy? you want to ask another question? Like, um, sorry, yeah, yeah. Um, there, are, there are contours in the Bible about gender that won't be popular, but essentially our humanity is endorsed in a way, both male and female, that even the, the, the strongest feminist can't match. Because feminism has no ground for saying women are equal to men, other than the fact that say women are equal to men. We do, because women are made in God's image just in the same way that men are. So our foundational document in its first chapter, in its foundational chapter, actually says we must believe this. And do otherwise is actually misunderstand our humanity, made in God's image. So we have a foundation for feminism that feminism doesn't have. Don't put it that way. <coughs> yeah. Thank you. All right, uh, that wasn't from Luke, though. Okay, uh, good. Um, there were two issues. Who, are, who, which group did other issues? Take a lot of things. Other objections? Who did the different ones? Yeah, we did. Kate wants to tell you about that. Please. <laughs> <laughs> we did. I'm happy and successful. Everything is fine. I just can't see that I've got. Yeah, great. And then we kind of went, oh, well, I get to do a part of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so then uh, Ben and Chris did an awesome role play of them being a non Christian and answering those questions. Excellent. <laughs> and where did you get to? I think, I think it finished with Ben saying, what must I do to be saved? Any intermediate steps? <laughs> 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 um, we basically challenge each other on what it means to be happy and successful, and yep. try to define that and where that sort of meaning comes from. Try and get the person to internally realise um, where they're getting these ideas from and uh, how they are influenced by society and people and things. Yeah. And try to segue from that into um, the true meaning of this in God and in God alone. Yeah, 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 thank you, thank you. So um, let's so hold, hold that content because we want to cover all that kind of stuff. Um, think again about if, if someone says this, basically my life's going really well, I don't need God, what do they expect you to say? Right. Expect to say no, it's not. Yeah, no, no, your life sucks. You don't understand. You're an idiot, your life sucks. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they expect, yep. So what's the most surprising thing you could say that's true? What's the most surprising thing you could say that is actually true? Could it be call me when it stops being that way? <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us more about that? Well, that everyone goes through suffering. Eventually that person's going to stop thinking that getting drunk's the be all and end all of life. Yep, kind of the ticking clock kind of idea. Yeah, yeah and so, fun. well, here's my number. One day things won't be that good. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Here's my card. Yeah, so, so it gets bad. It could be that. Now, again, that sounds quite negative. I mean, it's, it's realistic, right? Yeah. But it actually sounds quite negative. Can you think of an even uh, more surprising and positive way to say it? Yeah. Um, I think it's 
And I can say my life is way better. <laughs> Actually, that's a, that is a surprising thing to say, isn't it? Because people expect you to say, oh, well, you know, my life's pretty awful and boring, but I've got God. Um, so that, that they're not expecting that. That's true. That's kind of a surprising uh, thing to say. You need to then be able to substantiate that, actually explain quite clearly why that's the case. Um, but that would be a very surprising thing to say to lead into a gospel discussion. Yeah. I might ask, uh, what do you think you be? Uh, will you be if you die tomorrow? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. It's, it's that, that's a like it's a, a question, so it's a fork in the road, which either can shut things down or open things up. So that that's very provocative in a really good way. Yeah, yeah, that's so great. I I agree because the only people who need God are other people who are going to die one day. So you know that's just great. You're going to <laughs> um, don't we all die one day? Like, yeah, so you kind of just look plain little kind of time bomb. Uh, anyway, um, and um, uh, so it's, it's again a way that you want to not uh, shut down the conversation but open it up. Get to somewhere where you talk about the deeper I meaning, the deeper realities of life, uh, deeper happiness. I think, Dave, some of the problems on that question is that so much of it is about selfishness. Happiness and success is all about self. Yeah, so yeah. It's really hard to help people see that actually loads of those ideas are bound in that. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I, thinking in terms of how would you surprise someone, Yeah. Uh, if they said, I'm happy and successful, everything is fine, I think I might turn to them and say, that's amazing, because loads of people I know aren't happy or successful. Yeah. Can you share your secrets of success? <laughs> yes. <laughs> What is the secret? And, and really probe them. Yeah, because yeah. ultimately it's going to be, well, what, it's about me and this is, so how does that work for other people? Yeah. 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 Thank you, that's really helpful. Again, they're, they're not thinking you're going to say that. No. It's like the last thing they're thinking. So, um, and yet it opens up the question. Some of the things we're wondering is with the passage, yeah. like it's, it doesn't quite give the positive aspect. So, you know, the guy builds bigger barns and dies, and yeah. the sentence at the end just says, you know, it's a punchline. But I'm wondering if you went over the, to the next section, yeah. actually it's saying, well, God provides all good things, yeah. and we don't need to be worried or concerned about those sorts. So it gives you the positive if you kept reading to the next passage. Yeah, yeah. And, and I wonder and if <coughs> you're trying not to be negative, yeah. to illustrate the positive, to read a little bit further in Luke, would be, would be better? It could be, it could be. The, the, the difficulty is that the... You might be right. <laughs> the, the, this person is so, either so in reality positive, or so in their projection of themselves positive, yeah. um, that you're wanting to, in a sense, sink their boat. Yeah. <laughs> you're wanting to kind of help them to see they need a life raft. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's not to kind of leave them, obviously, languishing and drowning, but to say, why don't you... Why don't we actually look at the deeper, richer life that you can find as we can. You do that stage, you can be the first bit, that will hang on that, yeah. and then say, that's not all. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah, thank you. That's really important. Really Anyone else tackle anything else? Any other issues? Any other objections with that? No, you're rather scared of agents. That's great. Uh, what I want you to do is to get back in those groups and tackle another one, okay? I'm going to give you only 15 minutes this time um, to tackle one. Um, and try again because I wanted you to kind of just kind of train your thinking, in a surprising, engaging way, like, open up questions and learning some information. Okay, make sense? So a different one this time. Uh, if you're a really fast, you've got 15 minutes. If you're a fast group, you can do two. If you're a slow group, you can do one. You can start at speed you up. Your time starts.